Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Luke chapter 15. We're in the second week of our short summer series called Yahweh, where we're talking about four attributes of God that God reminds Moses of when Moses was on Mount Sinai. We're calling this series Yahweh because Yahweh is one of the many names for God in the Bible, and it's the most used name in the Old Testament. It actually appears about 6,000 times, but it was the most holy and revered name. And so we saw last week that we've actually lost how to pronounce the word Yahweh. That's our pronunciation, but there's a number of different ways scholars think you should pronounce it because it was so seldomly said because it was so revered. And so that's, if you want to actually learn a little bit more about the name Yahweh, go back and watch last week. I actually learned some things when I was getting ready for that sermon. If you're a Bible nerd, you're going to love it because we're going to look at the Hebrew, or we looked at the Hebrew language. You can check out that sermon on either Facebook, or you can go to YouTube, or you can just go to our website and check it out there. All right. Well, let's look at this passage of Scripture that's kind of the theme passage for this series where God points out four attributes of himself, and he also calls himself Yahweh. Let's look at that together. This is Exodus 34, 4 through 7. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first one and went up on Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hand. Then the Lord came down in the clouds and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, there's Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. So in this scripture, we see this name for God, Yahweh, Yahweh, he calls himself that. But then he gives four attributes of himself, and at last, last week we looked at uh, the first attributes that he is compassionate and gracious, and today we're looking at the second description God gives of himself, slow to anger. Now this issue of God's anger, sometimes called the wrath of God, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. uncomfortable. It even makes a lot of Christians uncomfortable. We like to think about God as a God of love, and he is, an incredible love that we can't even begin to understand. But we don't like as much to think about God getting angry or God becoming wrathful. But if we miss out on the holiness and the justice of God, we're missing out on a big part of who he is. Because that's all a part of God. And we see this play out over and over in the Old Testament. God doesn't take our sin lightly. But he is very patient with us and he is slow to ang anger. I joke that the relationship between Israel in the Old Testament and God is kind of like the relationship between a teenager and a loving parent. It's just this constant cycle of disobedience, punishment, and repentance, right? So we see it play out like this, that there is disobedience to God, and then there is punishment by God after God's warned them, and then eventually there is repentance and remorse and forgiveness, and then followed closely thereafter by a new set of disobedience. And so the cycle continues, and time and time again, we see this in the Old Testament, but we also see how slow God is to anger. And, but we do see that when he has warned the Israelites, that he's told them what he's going to do, and they don't repent, and they don't change their behavior, then we will see punishment. And, and some of the harshest punishment in the Old Testament is when Israel began to worship idols. They would begin to practice the idolatry of the nations around them, worship false gods. And some of those idols had really horrible practices that they picked up. Maybe the worst of all of those was they picked up this practice of worshiping, worshiping the false god Molech. And part of the worship of Molech is that you sacrifice young children to Molech. And you did that by burning them alive in fire. And, and so you can imagine... God's anger. He warns them. He prepares them and says to repent and to stop it. And when they don't, then there's punishment and we get to see his anger. It's a dangerous mistake to think only of God as a God of love because our God is a holy God. And because of that, he has righteous anger that comes about by our sin. But what we see over and again is that he is very patient with the Old Testament Israelites, but he's also very patient with us, and he is slow to anger. Our women are actually doing something called the Bible recap, where they're going through the Bible, and yeah, there's a lot of you guys, ladies, doing it. I use guys very uh, loosely, 
And right now they've been reading through the Old Testament. And I've talked to several of them, and several of them have said, man, when you actually read some of the crazy disobedience that Israel was doing, we're surprised that God didn't punish them more often and harsher than he did. But even though we know that, we still get a little uncomfortable talking about the wrath or the anger of God. I was actually talking to somebody in the lobby last week after the sermon, and they said something that they didn't understand and really didn't like about the passage of Scripture that we're talking about. And, and they asked me a question about it. I thought it was a great question, so I think it's a great way to kind of kick off this discussion today about God being slow to anger. This is Exodus 34, 7. is the, the last part of the Scripture that we just read. And God said he is a God of love, and then we'll pick up there in verse 7, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And this person said, I don't understand that. And, and I don't agree with that. Why would God punish children and grandchildren for the sins of the parents? And, and I think that's a great question. And some of you guys may have heard that either last week or this week and went, why is that the case? So let me talk just a minute about that. Let me first of all say what this passage of Scripture isn't saying. This passage of Scripture isn't saying that God holds children accountable for the, parents, for the sins of their parents. It is not saying that someone is responsible for someone else's sin. We are each responsible for our own sin. But here's what it is saying. That there is a generational impact of sin. That the punishment of sin doesn't just impact the parent. The consequences of sin doesn't just impact the parent. That it can impact the children and grandchildren. And we see that play out over and over in the Old Testament. So I want to give you an example of this from some scripture in the Old Testament where we're going to see God is slow to anger, but then we're going to see the punishment and the consequences of sin impacts additional generations. There's a generational impact to sin. So let's look at this together in 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 17. And this is about the worship of the false god Molech and about sacrificing children in the fire. And so here's God's reaction. We get to see that in verse 15. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again. So here we see God warning them over and over because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers and despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So what do we see in this passage of Scripture? First of all, we see God being slow to anger. He warns them. He sends messengers. He sends the prophets. They reject the prophets. They refuse to repent and turn from their sin. And they continue to worship this false god Molech and do these horrible practices. And so eventually, we see the wrath of God. We see the anger of God arise. And he allows the Babylonian king, a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, to come and conquer the country and take a whole lot of them captive. And they were captive in Babylon for 70 years. So what do we see? We see the generational impact of the consequences and punishment of sin. So there were young kids that were killed when Nebuchadnezzar attacked. There were people that were taken captive and taken back to Babylon. So there were children that were born in Babylon that lived their entire life as a captive in Babylon, not because of anything they had done. They didn't worship Molech. They were impacted by the punishment and the consequences of the sin. And so we see that happen in different places in the Old Testament because the consequences and the punishment of sin can affect our whole families and they can be generational. But God doesn't hold us accountable for the sins of the other people. Does that make sense, the difference? And we see this generational impact of sin even today. It, it's still the same thing. What we see is kids that are the subject or are live in a house with a parent who struggles with addiction or abuse. We see that those kids are much more likely to have those same issues growing up. In fact, the Department of Justice issued a report that says that a child who lives in a home with abuse is six times more likely to abuse their own children than a child that wasn't. Do you see the in generational impact of sin there? And so what you see, so a parent abuses the child, the child becomes an abuser, abuses their child, we see three generations of the consequences and the impact of sin. 
And it can go further than that because that cycle continues. We can also see this in families where there is infidelity of the parents and we have divorces and things going on of that nature. That increases the likelihood, doesn't guarantee, but it increases the likelihood that the children will struggle with some of those same things. Did, did you guys see the, the movie Jesus Revolution? How many of y'all saw that? Yeah, a lot of you haven't. If you haven't seen it, it is a great Christian movie. And it's a true story based on a dude named Greg Laurie. And Greg Laurie uh, is a pastor today, but he grew up in a home where his mother struggled with addiction. She struggled with a, a number of divorces and different infidelity things going on. And so Greg's story begins where he got caught up in the hippie culture of the 1970s, and he struggles with drugs and experiments with drugs, and he was living in that wild era of the 70s and participating in that. And so we see the beginnings of the impacts of generational sin. But Greg broke the generational impact of sin because he would become a Christian, he would go on to become a pastor, and he would lead a revolution called the Jesus Movement. You guys that are old enough remember that in the 1970s that swept through the nation, and there was revival throughout the nation. Greg started a church in uh, California called the Harvest Christian Fellowship where thousands of people have followed Jesus through his ministry. So we see that the generational impact of sin can be broken with repentance and obedience. See, God is a holy God, and he does get angry at our sin. But what we see is that God is slow to anger. He's patient with us. Well, last week we used a story, a, a historical story from the Old Testament to talk about one attribute of God, compassionate and gracious. Well, this week we're going to actually use a parable in the New Testament to talk about how God is slow to anger. Now, Jesus would often teach with parables. What a parable is, is it's a made-up story that has a deep theological truth. In other words, he would use parables to compare two things. Usually it was comparing something to the kingdom of heaven or comparing something to God or our relationship with God or our relationships with one another. And today we're going to use the parable of the prodigal son to see how slow God is to anger. Well, let's get started. Look at Luke 15, 11 through 12. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So what you need to understand here is that the father is being compared to God. So when you see the father, that's the comparison that he's making our heavenly father God. The two sons that we're going to see in this story are us. And so as we go through this, I want you to first notice how slow to anger the father is. And some situations where he had every right to get angry and he doesn't. But as we go through this parable, I want you to also think about which son do I identify with more? Is it the prodigal son or is it the older brother? And so just kind of keep those things in mind when we talk about the sons. And what you need to know is they're both knuckleheads. I think that's actually a biblical term. And the father is patient with them. All right. So the younger son here, he doesn't want to wait for his father to die to get his share of the inheritance. So he goes to his dad and says, look, I, I want my, my share and I want it right now. It becomes very obvious in this story that he did not want this money to give to charity. He wanted this money to blow on himself. He was very selfish. And so the Jewish people that heard this parable would have immediately recognized and felt like, all right, this young son, he's the villain in this story. The father has every right here to get very upset because this would have been very disrespectful and disobedient by his child to not want to wait until the father's timing to pass along his estate. And so we see that he is the person here that's doing wrong. And so we expect here that the, the father is going to get angry and he's going to disown the son or he's going to cut him out of the will. Surely at least he's going to say, no, grow up. you got to wait till I die to get your share of, this, of the estate. But that's not what happens. The dad gives his son his share of the estate even though he doesn't deserve it. All right, let's keep going in verses 13 through 19. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? 
And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So here's what we see. This son gets his share of the father's estate, and he is immediately disrespectful to his father because he didn't stay and continue working in the fields. He leaves the father and goes to a far country. And what we see is he was probably having a great time while the money lasted. But eventually he was, uh, you know, it was clear here in a minute, you'll see that he was uh, hiring prostitutes and having wild parties and all this going on. And eventually he runs out of money. And, And the problem is, about the same time he runs out of money, there's a famine in this country. Now, he's not responsible for the famine. That was a circumstance. But he's absolutely responsible for blowing all of the money that he was given and spending it on the wrong things. And it gets so desperate that he is working in a pig pen and he wants to eat what the pigs are eating. Now, if you've ever owned pigs and I grew up with pigs, you do not want to eat what the pigs are eating. You understand the situation that he was in. We used to slop the pigs. And how that works is for several days we'd have this bucket. And whatever scraps were left from the meal, you'd go scrape off in this bucket. And after a few days of this, this undescribable, unknown liquid would start to build up in the bucket. It did not smell good. And then after the bucket got full, you'd take that and you'd go out to the pig pen and you'd slop the pigs. And it's called slopping because you'd just pour that into the, into the trough. And those pigs, they loved it. They would stick their heads all the way under where it was running down off their faces and that nasty, smelly liquid was dripping off their ears. You do not want to eat with the pigs. Pigs are smart, but they're filthy. And so that gives us an understanding of how bad things had gotten. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, the father doesn't immediately run to the far country and save his son from this hardship. He lets the son grow through consequences of his disobedience. And so we see here that the father is patient to allow him to grow, and there are consequences of the sin. It's also important to understand that This son only acknowledges that he made it messed up when he hits rock bottom. He he didn't immediately say, oh, I should have done something different and go back. No, no, no. As long as it's fun, he's he's not doing anything. He's partying with the prostitutes. Things are good. When he starts partying with the pigs, he gets desperate. And, And at this point, he realizes that he has no one to blame but himself. And this is a big moment of truth for him. This is a big decision point. And it's also a big decision point for us. We alone are responsible for our sin that separates us from the Father. No one else. But see, that's so tough on us because that's not what society teaches us. That's not our human reaction. The first thing we want to do is blame somebody else. We want to blame our spouse for the problems in our marriage. We want to blame blame our brothers and sisters for the trouble that we're having in our family. We want to blame our friends for what's going on in our friend group. We want to blame our employer or our coworkers for the problems that we're having at our job. We want to blame the church for when things are not going the way that we thought they would. We want to blame God when he doesn't treat us the way we think we deserve. And at a minimum, we blame our parents because they didn't prepare us for this. But the prodigal son... He owns it. He takes responsibility for his sin. And then the prodigal does something that changes everything. We see him repent of his sin. Look back at verses 18 through 19. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So we see him, he says, he's going to go back and repent. He's going to say, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against God, and I've sinned against you. And I'm not even worthy now to be called your son. That's desperate repentance. And that's such a good illustration of what we should do. That's what repentance looks like for us. Repentance isn't just going, "Uh, yeah, that probably wasn't right. It's not even saying you're sorry. Repentance, this idea of repentance and what it means is literally to turn around and go a different direction. Repentance is when we are broken before God. And we acknowledge our sin and we change our behavior and we change our thoughts and we do our best to change how we live. And that's what this prodigal son does. Look at the first half of verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. 
What a powerful statement that is. So he got up and did something. So often we realize there's a problem and it would say for us, so we realized it, but put it off for another day. But, but that's not what he does. He takes action. And that's what we have to do. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people that are trying to decide if they want to follow Jesus. And they say, you know, I'm going I'm to think about that. And so weeks will go by and weeks will turn into months. And, and they're still thinking about it. But that's not what we see from this story. It's action. It's not thinking about it. It is get up and doing something to change. It takes action. Notice, too, that he doesn't clean up his life before he goes back to the Father. It says he got up out of the pig pen with all the dirtiness and all the filth of that pig pen, and he heads home to repent to the Father. And that's such a beautiful illustration for us of what repentance looks like. We don't prepare ourselves for Jesus. It's not how that works. You know, so often I'll have people say, you know, I need to clean my life up a little. I need to, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm not ready yet because I've got some things that I need to take care of. Really what they're saying is, I want to keep doing those things that I'm doing for a little while longer. But true repentance doesn't clean up before Jesus. Jesus is the one that cleans us up. He is the one that changes everything. He says, follow me and I will make you clean. Listen to how John, the Apostle John says this in 1 John 1, 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, follow Jesus and he will clean you up. You now have the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit that is helping us. We don't become clean for Jesus. We become clean through Jesus. Does that make sense? That's the difference of what it looks like. Jesus cleans us up and makes us pure no matter how bad we messed up, no matter how dirty we are. When we take some action, we repent, and we accept this free gift from Jesus, it changes everything. So the prodigal son goes back to the father, and he's fully prepared for the father to be really angry at him. He's prepared to be disowned as a son and just be put out in the fields, hopefully, as a worker and just get to work for his dad and hopefully get some food. That's his expectation. He expects anger. But let's see what the father does. This is Luke 15, uh, 20 through 24. So he got up and went to the father. That's the verse we just talked about. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So what we see here is a son that probably had his head down, dreading this, this confrontation with his father where he had to repent and then be sent out to the fields, hopefully, to work. But as he's getting near the house, the father sees him and runs towards him. And in that culture, in Jewish culture, that would have struck them because fathers don't run to their kids. The kids come to the fathers. It would have been a little uncomfortable. It would have been a little embarrassing for the father to do that. But the father runs to him and he says, put a robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. He is my child. He was lost and now he's found. And, and see, this is such a beautiful picture of God. God is slow to anger. We treat him poorly. We disobey. We rebel against him. And yet, he's patient with us and he loves us. He's not angry at points even when he should. So he's waiting for us to come home so we can restore that relationship with him. But now somebody isn't excited about this. Somebody is actually angry about that. Let's see the older brother and how he reacts. This is tw verses 25 through 32. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. He's working for the dad here. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother, he becomes angry and refused to go in. So the father went out to him and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. 
My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So here's what we see from the older brother. We see he is coming in from the field. He's put in another hard day for the dad. And as he gets close to the house, he hears some music, and there's a party going on. Why is there a party going on while he's out in the field? So he says, hey, what's going on? They said, your brother has come home. He's not happy about that. He knows what his brother's been doing. His brother's been out blowing part of the inheritance that they're entitled to. And he's angry. And I'm sure when Jesus said this part of the story, all his listeners were going, yeah, he was angry. He had every right to be angry. And and I think we can identify with what's going on here. Because he's the one that's been home doing what he was supposed to be doing. Think about that. I'm sure when the younger brother left... Things got harder for the older brother. He had to now start doing chores and taking on responsibility to fill in the gap for his younger brother. He would work hard in the fields and he would come home sore and tired in the evenings only to see his father weeping over his lost child. He he was the one that was picking up the pieces while his brother was off living wildly in another country. And, And so it seems unfair that this younger brother would be welcomed with this sort of a party. But the father goes out to the older son and reminds them, you've been here all along. You've been receiving my love for all of these years. Everything I own is yours. But we have to be happy about what's happening. But the older son, he misses all that. I want to look back at verse 29. He says, but he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. He does what so many of us do when we get self-righteous. We, first of all, we exaggerate our obedience. You see that? He says, I have never disobeyed you, which is not true, right? Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not true. He exaggerates it. But he becomes self-righteous and tries to figure out what's going on. He compares himself to his younger brother and comes to the, the conclusion that he deserves more love than the younger brother because he has done what's right. And then he reminds the father, look, everything I've done for you, you've forgotten how I go out into the fields every single day and I slave for you. And isn't that what we do too? I mean, we'll have these conversations with God and we'll go, God, I mean, have you forgotten what I've done for you? I go to church every Sunday. Well, I mean, at least two or three times a week, a month. And I pray every day, I mean, when I think about it, and I give generously, I mean, when, it, when I can and when it doesn't impact my budget. And you still treat other people better than me. You know, that Christian down the street, why are his kids seeming to do better than my kids? Why does he have a better job than me when I am busting my behind for you? That's what this son does. He says, why are you blessing him when I'm doing the right thing? And he seems to get upset with the dad here. Because his dad is what? Slow to anger. He thinks the dad ought to be faster to anger. You ought to be really upset with the brother. But he forgets that God is also slow to anger with him and forgives him his sins. All right, here's another sinful attitude of the older son. Because he thought he was better than the younger son, he doesn't have any compassion on him. He doesn't understand the desperate situation that he's in. In fact, at one point, he won't even acknowledge that he's his brother. He says, your son, not my brother. He has no compassion. And don't we get the same way? We can see somebody that's struggling with addiction, and we think more about what they did to get in that situation than we think about how we can help them. Or or we see a homeless person, and we think about, what was it they must have done? What mistakes must they have made to get into that situation? Rather than showing them intentional grace and loving them where they are. But but that's not how Jesus loved people, and it's not how we're supposed to love people. Look, make no mistake, the prodigal son was where he was by his own conduct. He is responsible. Bad decision after bad decision. But now, he's in a desperate state. The older son does not see that, but the father does. And look, I, I understand the mentality of the older son, because I grew up thinking that you earn respect, that you earn appreciation, that you earn love in some respects by your success, by what you do. I have this joke about myself that that is 
And it's pretty true, but it's kind of funny. I say, I don't really care that much about winning, but boy, I hate to lose. And that's driven by my fear of failure. It is driven by this attitude that I have that I have to work on that says, I am worthy of things because of what I've done. And that's not why our Father loves us. That's a mistake so many people make. I can sometimes be disappointed when I don't think people are treating me the way that they should. Because I think, man, look at what I do. I I can be disappointed when I don't think things go my way with God because I'm like, God, have you seen what I've done? But don't be like the, the older brother. That's not, God does not love us because of what we do. Think about this. Who was the most holy, loving, perfect person that's ever lived? Jesus. How was he treated? He was beaten and mocked and cursed and nailed to a cross. Don't be the older son in this parable. Don't be filled with bitterness at God and other people because God is slow to anger. Be thankful that God is slow to anger because you've got a lot to be forgiven of as well. The reality of this parable is that neither son really understood the the dad. They thought that the dad was going to be angry. The younger son, he messed up, disobeyed, rebelled against his father, and then he comes home. He has no expectation that he has any right, and he doesn't have any right to be loved. But the father is slow to anger. The older brother thought that the father's love was built on how much you had obeyed, how much you had worked, how much you had done. But, But that's not what the father was loving them for. The the father didn't love them because of what they'd done. The father loved them because of who they are. They are his sons, and he loved them for that. God the father doesn't love us for what we've done. He loves us for who we are. Listen to how the apostle Paul says this in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were disobedient, while we were rebelling, Christ showed incredible love by giving his life for ours. God the Father doesn't love us based on what we've done. He loves us for who we are. He is slow to anger and he's waiting for us to come home. Notice too that the father left the party for the younger brother. What did he do? He went out to meet the older brother. He's waiting on him to come home too. He's waiting on both of the kids to come home. Our Father loves us passionately, and he's waiting for us to return home so that he can pour out his love for us, a love that we can't even begin to understand. Our Heavenly Father is patient, and he's slow to anger. He's always waiting for us to come home. I heard another preacher tell the story of a lady in their church, and she and her husband were taking care of her elderly dad after her mom died. They they moved the elderly dad into their house, and he lived with them for a while, but after his, uh, his health deteriorated to the point that they couldn't take care of him, they had no choice but to put him into a nursing home. The nursing home that was nice enough that they wanted to choose it was about an hour away, and so they couldn't go visit the father every day. But, but every Sunday after church, they'd load up in the car, and they would go visit for the afternoon with her dad. And the dad loved those visits. And so every Sunday, he'd be sitting out on the front porch of the nursing home waiting for them to arrive. And this happens Every week, I mean, like clockwork, they go to see him, and he's waiting for them on the front porch. But over the years in the nursing home, his mental condition starts to deteriorate, and he begins to forget things that he once knew, and he begins to get very confused. He would sometimes think that his wife was still alive, and he would not remember people, even sometimes his own children. And the the daughter began to realize, how does he know? (laughs) And, And because every Sunday, he was still out on the porch waiting for them. And so one time during the visit, she says, Dad, do you know what day it is? And he thinks for a minute, and he says, no. And she said, Dad, then how do you know to sit out front on the front porch every Sunday waiting on us? And he thought about it a minute, and he said, I sit on the front porch and wait for you every day. What a beautiful picture of what our loving Father, waiting patiently for us to come home. We worship a God who loves us, who is slow to anger and patiently waiting for his children so that he can love them and forgive them. That's the picture. God is slow to anger. Let's pray.